Amen. Let it be Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise His name. Good to see you today and this great Lord's Day as we come together to open His Word. Before we do, I want to tell you a little story about Johnny. He got a job at the grocery store and they put him in produce and wasn't about the third day a lady comes to him and says, I want a half a head of lettuce. I said, we don't sell a half a head of lettuce. Says, I want a half a head. Well, just buy it and cut it and save it. I want a half a lettuce. I'm not leaving here until I get it. So Johnny walks back to where they store the produce and hollered at his worker back there and said, there's this crazy old nag that wants a half a head of lettuce, not knowing she followed him back there. And then he turned around and saw her and said, and this sweet, adorable woman wants the other half. Well, the manager looked and thought, hey, that guy's pretty sharp. He may be manager material. So, Johnny, I'm impressed how quick you got out of that one. Uh, where are you from, Johnny? He said, I'm from Reading, Pennsylvania, where all they have is ugly women and hockey players. The manager said, I'd like you to know that my wife is from Reading, Pennsylvania. Johnny says, well, what team does she play for? <laughs> you know, we're always trying to get out of a situation, Amen. Well, God's not necessarily concerned about us just getting out of a situation. He wants us to use every situation to be more like Christ and to be able to have our life used more for Christ. And uh, being the Christmas season, we'll look at how our life can be poured out. Our love gift on Jesus. That's what we all looked at this morning. So much of our focus has to be with us getting gifts at Christmas and it's his birthday, we ought to be giving her a gift. And I believe that one of the greatest gifts you can give him is just pour out your life as a love gift back to him. We can't pay it back, but we can pay it forward and we can give him our life as a love gift just for all he's done for us. And this morning we'll be looking at Mary as she gave her love gift to Jesus. And as you look at that, picture there portrayed. We're going to be focusing a lot on that little vial that's there on the ground broken that uh, represents so much, I believe, in this story and how she uh, came about presenting that love gift to Jesus. So is, you're just operating it all back there? Okay. Well, anyway, let's look at several aspects of this story. It's in Mark 14. First of all, we want to look at the place, the location of this event said, while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table. So we know the city that this is located in is in Bethany. And the place is Simon the leper's house. Now obviously when we look at this, we began to think, well, what is he doing going into the leper's house? Wouldn't he and everybody else be unclean? Well, obviously we can read into this that you didn't associate in public when you had leprosy. And so obviously he had been healed of leprosy. And since leprosy is incurable, it had to be healed by Jesus. And so uh, uh, here he is in the presence of Jesus, having a meal with Jesus in his home. And there Jesus is reclining as normal would be in the Middle East to be participating in the meal. Second of all, we'll look at the woman. It said, there came a woman into the house. Well, who is this woman? Well, if you look in John's episode of this, it was in John chapter 12, which is the same story. We get a little more in insight from looking at both Mark and John to see what uh, is going on. I'm getting a little bit of echo up here. We can, um, who is this? Well, this is Mary, and there's a lot of Marys in the Bible, but this is Mary, the sister of Lazarus and Martha. You remember the story when Lazarus and Martha had Jesus over? You remember the story when Lazarus died? Well, this is that Mary, the Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Well, she doesn't come empty-handed because the third point there is she brings a vial of perfume. That's on the next slide there. It said, with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. So let's break this passage down because there's so much here we need to see because this story 
even at the end, is going to be proclaimed by Jesus to never be forgotten, that the memory of what she just did is going to be known throughout the world, and, and uh, we need to pay close attention to what she did. Well, let's break this down. First of all, let's look at the container. The container was an alabaster vial. This was uh, probably Egyptian marble, very costly. Even the container was very costly because it was imported from Egypt. Uh, it was very common for these vials to contain fragrances, perfumes that would use to carry these to uh, have an opening on it where you could pour out your perfume, seal it back up, and use it another day. So that was what the container was. Second of all, the contents. The contents were pure nard. This was a perfume. This nard plant only grew in India. And uh, so it had to be imported. It was uh, a, a very fragrant aroma. Uh, wasn't produced, obviously, locally, and so it had to be uh, imported from India, and thus, thus raising the, the cost of it, which leads us to the third point, is its cost. Verse 5, we'll see later on, when they're arguing about her even doing this, not Jesus arguing it, but the Judas and the disciples were fussing about how much money this one vial of perfume was worth, the value comes up in the conversation that it was worth, the vial itself and the perfume in it, 300 denarii. Now, a denarii is a day's wage. Now, factoring out holidays and days off and all that, an average worker would work about 300 days a year. So this one bottle of perfume was worth about a year's wage. Now think about it for a moment. You saved up one year's wage. Think of how much you make. And if you saved up a whole year's wage, that's how much it would take you to buy this one vial of perfume. Think back to the last time you gave a gift that cost you a whole year's wage. I'm waiting because you're still thinking. <laughs> that probably never happened. <laughs> it's like, well, I can't think back to that point because that point never happened. So you and I probably have never, I know I hadn't given a gift that cost me a whole year's wage, but she did. That's what this perfume bottle cost. And the scriptures indicate its value because really the story is only going to be completely significant when we realize how much this cost. She didn't buy that for five shekels down at the local Israel Walmart. You know, it just didn't happen. This was imported. This was pure, unadulterated nard, which was very expensive from India. And so how'd she get this money? I don't know. I mean, did she save it up? Somebody give her a gift and she was able to buy it? Somebody present? I don't know. But whatever it did, this cost her a lot of money. Whether she saved it or inherited it or whatever, sold some land to get it, but this perfume was very expensive. Now, also next was the cause. What was it used for? Well, she poured it over Jesus' head. She just, and that was customary of the day to honor somebody, even the psalmist in Psalms 23 talks about God ministering to us. He anointeth our head with oil. It's an honoring. It's a, an honoring thing to do for somebody that's a guest in your home. If we read John 12, 3, you can see that text. He refers to it that she also anointed his feet as well. So his feet and his head were anointed by this fragrant perfume that uh, she gave out to Jesus. Now if we look at this life of Mary, we find her doing something unique every time we see her in Scripture. Let's look at it. First of all, we see her at the feet of Jesus when she's listening to him in Luke 10. Remember they have the uh, dinner? Remember Martha's rushing to get everything ready in the pots and pans and the dishes and whatever, and all Mary's doing is sitting there at Jesus' feet listening to what he has to say. Of course, there's a little squabble between the two, like, hey, she needs to help me. And Jesus was saying, she's doing the better part. Not that the setting up and getting ready for the meal wasn't important, but it's more important to sit down and listen to Jesus. Remember that. That's just a lesson that you get free today. Is just, just sitting down, listening to Jesus is the most important thing. 
What Jesus says and what Jesus says in His Word and what Jesus said when He was here, that's all important, the most important. And, and where was she doing that? She was listening at His feet. If you look at John 11, she's also, I, I call it, at His feet to believe. Remember what happened in John 11. Her brother Lazarus dies and Jesus shows up after He's dead and uh, uh, Mary's like, well, if you'd have been here, He wouldn't have died. A lot of people take that as criticism, like it's your fault kind of thing. I, I don't think I believe that Mary meant it that way. I, I think she meant it in faith and belief, like I so believe in you that if you'd have been here when he was sick, he would have been healed. He wouldn't have died because you are God. You know, I believe she had that much faith in him to believe if he would have been present, her brother would still be living. So she was, and where did she make that proclamation? At his feet. And then this incident, which we see in Mark, but also in John, she's worshiping by anointing his feet with, with oil and his head with oil. And uh, so she's at his feet for worship too. And being that he's reclining, she's down low with his feet and she's down low with his head because he's reclining, kind of laying down while he was eating. That's really the kind of eating I like to do, just be laying there. You can lay down and eat. I mean, you get two good things at the same time. But anyway, but we have to sit up in chairs to be proper. But anyway... But he, her, her posture is always down low. Down low is the best place to go. For those of you that play golf, you don't look for high scores. You look for low, because low is best, right? Well, I guess a lot of y'all don't get low enough to know that, I guess. But yes, low scores, from what I hear, I don't play golf. That's the best, the low score, not the high, you know? And all of what she's doing is humbly down at his feet. So I don't think, I think our pride gets in the way of a lot of our blessing. We got to get down low. Down low is where it is. Down low is where the gift. I think we're shopping for stuff on the top shelf when all God's putting everything on the bottom shelf. You know, I read an article, and you say, boy, you're bored, uh, that was talking about all the bargains that are on shelves and stores on the bottom shelf. I mean, the whole article was on, I think it was called Low Shelf Bargains. You know, all the good stuff's at the bottom. And with Jesus, how much do we miss because we're up high, not down low? You know, I mean, a good mom would put the cookie jar down low for the kids to get to it. But no, they got to put it up high where they can't get to it, you see. So down low is where we want to go. And this is where Mary's getting all of her blessings. And she's always down low at the feet. And that's where we need to be for the blessings of the Lord. The next one is not only the container, the contents, the cost, the cause, but the crushing. It says she broke the vow. Um, and then, then the question comes up there on the screen there, well, why did she, uh, why'd she break it? Why didn't she just uh, open it? It was a container. I kind of picked up something. Obviously, this isn't a year's wage. This was a Hobby Lobby, but, uh, <laughs> you know, strictly it's $3.99. But anyway, something that kind of looked like it. I'd imagine it was probably about this shape. It was, uh, it was Egyptian marble. And, and obviously, whatever it did, it had some sort of top to it because you wanted to keep it and keep it fresh and like perfume today. You don't want the air to get to it. So it did have a top. She could have opened it, is my point. She could have took off the container and, uh, and then the story had been over. But that's not what the scripture says. Now where she did all this, I don't know if she went over maybe to some rock or some table that was in the place where she was there at Simon's house. But somehow she had to take it and she broke it. And I guess she just left the container because once you break it, you, don't, uh, you can't seal it up anymore because now it's broken. That's what she did. She had to do something. She had to hit it against something. She had to break the vow to get what was inside versus taking off the lid. I don't think we can go any further on this without trying to look at why. Why didn't she just open it? like anybody else would open any other bottle of perfume, 
use it and be done. I'm glad you asked because we got to look and I think it's probably symbolic. I believe because of everything she had, I believe, I believe this bottle represented her life. This was her. This was her coming to minister to her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it represented her life. Let's look at those two. First of all, the breaking represented, I think, complete surrender and devoted ministry to Jesus for this reason. Once you break it, you can't reseal it. So she, her intent was, I'm pouring all of this out on Jesus. We ain't bringing this stuff home. It ain't going to be used by me or anybody else because it's going to be empty and there's no use taking the lid off because I'm chunking it when I'm done. It's complete surrender to Him. All I have, I'm giving to Jesus. I'm not holding anything back. You do realize what we hold back is what's holding us back. That just came up. I wasn't even in my notes, I promise. I have to rewrite that down, but it just came out. That was the Spirit. It's all the Spirit anyway. It didn't mean anyway, but anyway, it just came out. But that's what's going to mess us up. Look at your life, what messes you up. It's like right there messed me up. What, what happened? You didn't give that to Jesus. You held that back for you. He ain't going to have my finances. He ain't going to have my relationships. He's not going to have my job. He's not going to have my money. He's not going to have my family life. He's not going to have my time. He's not going to have my talent. That's what messes you up right there. It's the very thing you don't, you hadn't made the commitment. I'm pouring it all out. He's got it all. It's complete surrender. You know, just like the cops when they say, come out with your hands up, surrender. You know, why they say, won't they just say, won't you surrender? Well, because they want to make sure you're not bringing anything else out. And if your hands are up, you, you don't, you're not bringing, you are surrendered. You know, if you do this, you may not be surrendered. You may have your hand on a gun. That's not surrender. They want you to complete surrender, so they say, put those hands up. I've often wondered if that's the symbolism of worship and raising your hands. I'm surrendered, nothing in my hands. I've given it all up. I'm worshiping. I'm not holding back. I'm pouring out. I'm giving it to Jesus. And maybe that was one of the reasons she did. If you look at David as the psalmist, he said the sacrifices are God or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. You're not going to despise that. My brokenness, and of course, when we get broken, we get surrendered. That means we're repentant, and we're devoted, and we're sorry, and we're sacrificial, and we're laying it before God in obedience to His Lordship. Matter of fact, Spurgeon once said, He, God, despises what man esteems and values what they despise. <laughs> That's how God looks at things. Man's putting so much value on stuff, and God, and I mean, like that. And then what man just absolutely despises, God steams and says, That's good. Man just, society just turns it around. Matter of fact, in Psalms 34 18, the Lord is near to thee. I wonder how that verse ends. I, I, I'm interested in how it ends, aren't you? I am. I want the Lord to be near me i got to find out how this verse ends because he's near to these people, whoever these people are described. Well, let's look at... Uh, oh, wow. He's near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Well, I want to be part of that. Continue being brokenhearted, meaning surrendered and tender, and, and I want to be the Lord to be near. In Hosea 10, 12, it says, Break up your... Fallow ground, that hard ground. See, it's the same way with earth. You know, we always, the Lord talked about the seed planted and all the soil examples. Well, it's the same thing here. We can't grow in the Lord and the seed have good effect in our life unless, just like the farmer, he has to plow it up or disc it up or break it up. He has to break that soil up to where it's pulverized and it's, it's broken. Now, if you say, I'm not going to be broken, well, then you be a farmer and don't plow your soil. Just let it be hard like brick. Don't plow it or don't do it. And throw your seed out and say, I want something to eat. Well, you're going to starve to death because you're going to come out in a month and all you're going to have is rotted seeds on top of the ground. And you're going to say, what? Why don't I have food? Why don't I have crops? 
because you didn't do like Hosea said, is, and Hosea is talking about our heart, break up that hard ground. Be broken. And the seed can come and take root and bear fruit. So brokenness is a theme there for there to be produce and growth. You see, horses like a lot of things. Horses like you to feed them hay and sweet feed, and they like you to brush them and pet them. They don't mind all those things. They don't mind making a warm bed for them. They don't mind you building a barn for them to be in, or they don't mind you building a stall for them to have the feed in and eat out of. Uh, they don't mind you giving them an apple and uh, brushing their mane. They said, that's cool. Do whatever you want. But what horses don't like is to be broken because they're wild. And they're, they're, that's something they fight against. You've seen the old westerns where they're bucking and knocking off the rider and knocking off the rider because they're saying, we don't want anybody on our back telling us where to go, when to go, when to stop, when to turn right, when to turn left, when to back up, when to go forward. We don't want that. You can do all that other stuff all you want. You, just, just, don't, just don't break us. You know, they even call a, a horse that's almost broke, green broke. I mean, it's almost there, but not quite. A lot of Christians are green broke. <laughs> We're almost there, but the Lord's saying, no, let me on top. And let me be the Lord of your life and control where you go. Brokenness. Once that horse gets broken, then that rider, the owner, the master, the ruler, has control of the reins because the horse has been fully broken. There's a song called Sweetly Broken. Rest assured, I'm not singing it, so just chill out right there. You know, we don't want any more exits out the back doors, but here's the, the, the chorus. At the cross you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, lost for words, so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, wholly surrendered. Sweetly broken, it's like I'm doing this because I want to be broken, and it's going to be a sweet thing. Because when I'm broke before the Lord, it'll bring a blessing. And I'm wholly surrendered because I am broken. I've decided to break and pour it all out on Jesus. I'm surrendered all. And I believe that's what she did when she broke it. She said, this is all going out for Jesus. We ain't holding anything back. If it represents my life, then it's all His. He had already saved her. She was so grateful. She brought this expensive perfume. I think the second thing this represents is the breaking represented her life's priorities. In the Middle East, let's say if uh, I came over to your house and you had a meal for me and you had that plate and the cup and I ate from that meal and, and you came out and you said, Pastor Tim, man, we just so respect you and honor you that we couldn't even imagine serving anybody else on this plate and cup. If somebody else came into our house and we got that plate that you ate from and that cup you drank from, we just think we'd just be dishonoring. That's how highly we think of you. So what we're going to do is we're just going to break it and throw it away and break it and throw it away. Nobody else would be so honored to be able to touch that plate and cup because it was yours. So if I ever come over to your house, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we lost a plate when Brother Tim here. We threw it at him, but not that. But anyway, or he was eating so fast it broke. But anyway, the lesson was that this was an honoring in the Middle East. I think she was saying, once I use this, how could I ever use it for myself or anybody else once I used it for Jesus? How could, it, how could I even dare use this vessel for somebody else after it was used for Jesus? Her priority was so Him first that she said, I put Him in such priority in my life, He's first place that I just got to break it. 
once I use it. I believe that might have been her mentality. You see, because priority is important. You know, if you tell your wife, hey, there's three billion women in the world, and you're one of them. <laughs> She's not going to be impressed with that. Are the 20 most important women in my life, you're in the top three. <laughs> She'd have a number for you, too. It's called 357 Magnum is what that would be for you, you know. Nothing but first place impresses anybody. And especially God, who if He's not first, He's not the Lord of your life. That requires that position. And for her, I think she was saying, Jesus, you're first. And I'm breaking it and throwing it away. Because I don't want to go back home and use it for me. Now, there are things that the Lord allows to bless ourselves too. But here was her symbolism, I believe, of her priority to Jesus. But then nothing comes without the next point, opposition. You think the story could have ended there. Everything would have been so happy and everything going so good, but not so. There's always opposition from people and even from ourselves. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? Wasted. For this perfume might have been sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor and they were scolding her. That's going to happen. You have people in your family and at your work and at your school that are saying, you are wasting your life going to church, reading the Bible, living holy, avoiding all the wildlife and the wild parties and using all your time and your talent and giving all that money to the Lord. You are a waste. Why don't you wake up and live like the rest of the world lives and quit being a waste? You kind of hear that from the world, don't you? You Christians. You just, just don't know how to live. Just living your life is a waste. You're wasting your money on tithes. You're wasting your time on labor. Wasting your time reading your Bible and praying. Just wasting, wasting, wasting. Now the bad thing about it was this was being generated, if you read the whole story, by Judas and the disciples. They were all egging this on. Could have been a little bit of jealousy there. She was giving all this to Jesus because she loved him. And they were coming up with some reason to scold her and to chasten her. Of course, Judas was looking to get, not to give. And if you compare the two people, what was Mary doing? Pouring out. What was Judas, Judas about to do? Sell out. Those are two choices. We pour out or we just sell out. Mary said, I'll pour out. And Judas says, I'll sell out. I'll get some money off denying him and turning me in, turning him in. Then comes, after the opposition, comes the honoring. First of all, she did good. But Tim, how, how, come, how do we know she did good? Because Jesus said she did good. And if Jesus says you did good, you don't need to worry about what anybody else thinks. Jesus says, good, that's all you need. Take that to the bank. Let everybody else say what they need to say in opposition. Amen. Amen. But Jesus said, let her alone. If Jesus says, let her alone, you better let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed for me. Woo! Don't you want Jesus when you lay your head down at night saying, what you did today was a good deed for me. Leave him alone. Leave her alone. What she did today was a good deed for me. You done any good deeds for Jesus lately? Oh, laying your head knowing that Jesus, not anybody else, may nobody even noticed it, but Jesus notices all. He said, she did good. She did good. The next thing is she did what she did when it could be done. 
Jesus said, for you always have the poor with you. Remember, they wanted to sell that money and give it to the poor. He wasn't saying that that's not a, that that's, that's a bad thing, but he's just saying, you always have the poor with me, and whenever you wish to do good to them, you can do good to them, but you do not always have me. Amen. See, Mary didn't have years to do this. She didn't have months to do this. She didn't have weeks to do this. She had days to do this because this was less than a week before the crucifixion. She only had a few days. If she's going to do something good for Jesus, she had, about, she had less than seven days to do it. And if she decided to do it later than that, she couldn't have done it. We all have opportunity in life to do things for Jesus. And when those opportunities are gone, they're gone. We've all done it. Have you ever known you went to a, somebody you wanted to tell something to somebody? And they died. I mean, you said, man, I wish I'd have got a chance to tell them this or do this for them or whatever. And now you can't because they're dead. You missed that opportunity. I've done that. And it hurts to say, why didn't I do that sooner? I made a call less than a year ago to tell that to somebody. And I got over his brother and he said, he died a few months ago. And boy, would he have loved to have heard that. And I got... I got pricked to do it about a year before that, and I got busy. The opportunities we have are limited. You know things you wish you would have said at a particular event, and that event's gone. And you say it would only really meant something at that event. And I didn't say it, I didn't do it. Why? Because you missed an opportunity. Our life is an opportunity. And if we're saying, you know what, when the kids grow up, then I'm going to, and when I retire, and then I'm going to, when I get out of high school, I'm going to, when I finish college, I'm going to, uh, when I get this promotion, I'm going to, when I get a little bit more time, I'm going to, when I finish my building project, I'm going to, when I finish that, I'm going to. We don't know we're going to even get to that point. We don't even know if we're going to tomorrow. We could be gunned out today. The English teachers going to kill me on that, but that's, you just, you don't have but a window of time. If you're going to do it, you got to do it. This is our window of opportunity. If Christ has saved you and He has redeemed you, then our life is to say, now I want to pour out my love on Jesus. I have a love gift. It's broken. I'm broken. I want to pour it out on Him and I have a window of opportunity to do it and I don't want to say I waited too late. Because once we're gone, we're gone. And this gives us an opportunity. We don't know what the future holds, so if we don't do it today, we may not be able to do it tomorrow or the next day or the next week. Now, the next thing was she did what she could. Jesus said, she has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. I don't know if she was thinking that. I mean, we don't know. She may have been thinking he's going to die, and I want to use this symbolically to show I'm anointing him for burial. But that's how Jesus viewed it too whether she did or not, but listen to his words. She's done what she could. So many people say, but Brother Tim, I can't sing. I can't preach. Uh, I can't teach. I can't do this. I can't do that. Well, that, okay, you can't. She, Jesus said she did she, he didn't say she tried to do what she couldn't. <laughs> Jesus said she did what she could. See, there's even some things I can't do that he can do through me, which is what I'm doing up here. <laughs> Whatever he calls you to do, you can do, even if it's what you couldn't do. <laughs> so even what you can't do, you might could do if you let him do it through you. You might find out even what you couldn't do, you can do. Am I right? If you tried it, you say, whoa, that's a spiritual gift he's doing through me what I didn't even think I could do because I, I wanted to do it for him and I found out by trying it Lo and behold, he does it through me. But whatever it is, he's looking for what either you can do or he can do always through you is what is really what it all even when you can, the reason you can is because he's allowing you to. So don't let's don't look at what we can't do, look at what we can do. That's what Jesus said. She did what she could, leave her alone. And then lastly, she is always remembered for what she did. Truly I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of her in memory of her. Guess what? Part of that statement's being true today from this pulpit. I'm letting you remember Mary. 
2,000 years she's not forgotten. But boy, there's a lot of rich people who made a lot of money and did a lot of things. We don't even know their name. But Mary's always going to be remembered because it's going to be preached from the pulpit until Jesus comes. So this is true. It's coming true today. We're remembering what she did and making a big deal of it because Jesus made a big deal of it. And Jesus noticed. And He loves to honor, I believe, those who honor Him. The Word says He honors those who honor Him. Our life is like a thank you card to Jesus. Written out each and every day. And then we notice something else there that happened in that passage in John. When she did that, the house was filled with that fragrance of that perfume. It was not only a blessing to Jesus, it was a blessing to that whole house. Ooh, that smells good. When you do things for Jesus, that smells good to everybody. It's a blessing to everybody. Everybody in that house was saying, man, that perfume just fills the house. There's something about... I remember when, when I was about 16 or maybe 70 at the most, I, I went to a store. I tell you how old it is. The store's not even open anymore. Not even a business. But anyway, I went there, and you know, they had the cologne counter, you know, 16-year-old trying to... Be cool, you know, buy the, buy the best. And, you know, they got too many just choices. By the time you spray the fifth one, you don't know where you, you're back down on his back. You know, you know, you know, sprayed that arm and that arm. And I couldn't make up my mind. And then there was these two girls. They were probably teenagers over here, and they were on the other side. And they were, I guess, buying it for somebody, you know. And they go, oh, man, I just, don't you just love a guy that wears da, da, whatever it was? I can't remember what it was. Oh, man. They were just going all kind of crazy. And so they left. I'm going to tell the truth of Jabe and the devil. I went, I said, give me a bottle of that. <laughs> and it never had that effect, ever. <laughs> I should have took it back, but it, I guess you got to have some other things going for you. I don't know. <laughs> but nobody ever went, ooh, ooh, like that. But perfume has an effect. It affects people how they feel or how they respond or the mood they're in. It just has a certain when fragrance. And this affected not only Jesus, but the whole house. And when we love Jesus and pour out life on Jesus, you say, well, He's not here right now. Jesus said, when you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. He asked Peter, do you love me? Jesus said, yeah. And feed my sheep. You want to show you love me? Feed my sheep. Just go do that. If you love me, we, we can be the fragrance in the church when somebody comes in. They smell, oh man, that smells like pouring out perfume in this place. Because people are loving Jesus and loving each other. That's how the world knows we're saved. That we're believers, we're disciples. How we love one another. Boy, that perfume just goes out to the church and goes into the community. You see, we're really just telling Jesus thank you with our life. Remember the ten lepers? Remember Jesus healed all ten and they're walking around. They're, now they're leaving. They get healed on the way. And then they look and, and we're, we're healed. We had an incurable disease and now we're healed. And one of them turns back. He's got to go tell Jesus, thank you. And Jesus kind of says this, where's the other nine? Didn't I heal ten and one comes back to praise the Lord? Where are those other guys? Well, they're kind of like some of us can be. We just take it for granted. We're not committed to church anymore. We're not committed to the Lord anymore. Yeah, we got saved, but kind of forgot about what that was all about. But when we truly are grateful for what God does, our life becomes that thank you note. Even this story. Whose house was it in? Simon the leper. What could he do? I got a house. I know how to cook. I got food. I'll do that for Jesus. This whole story, one could pour out, one could make the meal, one could have the house. I mean, you can do something. 
He was thanking Jesus, I'm sure, for his healing by at least throwing the party, throwing the get-together. Everybody's trying to find a way for their life to be poured out on Jesus. And we all have to ask ourselves the next question. Are we pouring our life, our love gift out on Jesus like this woman did? Is that what our life is? And we finding what we can do, whatever it is. We may be limited in many ways, but we can find out ways we can, ways we can do something to show our love for Jesus. Our commitment, our devotion, our service, we can find a way, like this woman, to pour out, to pour out all she had on Jesus. She looked, I'm sure, on that shelf. Or maybe she went and bought it right before she got there. I don't know. But she says, you know what? I'm sure since she knew before she got there, she says, this is going to be for him. And it required brokenness on her own life. And I'm sure if she took this bottle home, she probably put it up on her mantle. <laughs> she had one and said, you know, that represents my brokenness before the Lord. Because, you know, my truck is only useful when it's not broken. Amen. But Tim Strickland's life is only useful when it is broken. Because we have to be broken and wholly surrendered before the Lord. And then we're used because we are so grateful when we're broken because we've completely surrendered. And our life becomes a complete pour out not a complete sellout like Judas, but a complete pour out when we give our lives completely to Christ. Now, we should at salvation, but sometime we take part of our life back. And so this morning we can say, Lord, have we completely surrendered to you? With every head bowed and every eye closed as our music team comes.